It looks like the 80s is back on the menu, boys. Ghostbusters, Frozen Empire, The Fall Guy, Beetlejuice 2, an untitled Karate Kid movie, Cobra Kai, and of course, Roadhouse are all sequels, prequels, and remakes of movies and TV shows from that decade. That should tell you one thing. The 80s were awesome. It was a simple decade that took the action movie genre to new heights. There was a standard formula set for action films. The formula of the three B's, baby. These B's form the iron triangle of action movie success, and they are babes, bullets, and bros. Now, having my complete iron triangle of B's meant a surefire success for a movie. But Copa, you master of movie mayhem. I understand babes, bullets, and bros, but what about story and plot? Plot? Who gives a shit about plot? Who the fuck is this? This is Deputy Chief of Police Dwayne T. Robinson, and I am in charge of this situation. Just make the plot as simple as possible and you're good to go. So in 1989, the first Roadhouse was released and it followed my Iron Triangle of action films to a T. It had babes. Won't make pretty women. It had bullets. And it had bros. You taught me as much as I ever taught you. I love you, Mijo. 89 Roadhouse had Copa's Iron Triangle of action movie success on lock. With a $15 million budget, it went on to gross $61 million. What sent Roadhouse into cult classic status was all the other Nito Burrito elements going on in it. It had monster trucks, a kick-ass soundtrack, men with mullets wearing tight jeans, roundhouse kicking each other in the face with their cowboy boots, shirtless Tai Chi in front of a barn, awesome one-liners. Pain don't hurt. I want you to be nice until it's time to not be nice. I used to fuck guys like you in prison. <laughs> and a plot that was so simple, even a brain dead monkey could follow it. But the best part of all is that Patrick Swayze's brother and weekend serial killer cosplayer, Don Swayze, was nowhere to be seen. We're gonna be out on open ocean. Any anything can happen out there. No laws, right boy? Just us and our tasty treats. So this new Roadhouse starring Jake Gyllenhaal and Conor McGregor took everything that made the 1980s Roadhouse special and I would say Roundhouse kicked it out of the fucking window but there was not one Roundhouse kick to be found. Something that was very intricate to the plot of the first Roadhouse. There was also no mullets. Also a major plot device. <laughs> This new roadhouse opens up with a point of view shot, and you're in the middle of pit fighting. You are not Dalton, though. You are, of course, Post Malone. Think about it. Don't you want to live in that body even just for a few minutes? So you might be thinking to yourself, okay, I'm going to be viewing the entire movie through Post Malone's point of view. But no, he fucks off stage left once Jacked Gyllenhaal shows up on screen to fight him. They honestly tried to make out Post Malone to be this fearsome fighter who is taking all comers. And I will be honest, he does look like he takes on all comers being circled by men, but there isn't fighting involved. Dalton collects his winnings from the forfeit. Watching all this happens is Frankie, the owner of the Roadhouse. Yes, the bar is called the Roadhouse. It's in the Keys, which is in the Florida. Frankie was originally there to offer Post Malone the position of head bouncer. After seeing that Jack Hall struck fear to the heart of a man who has the body of chewed bubblegum, she's going to go with the guy who has washboard abs that he lathers with eels every night before bed. She offers the job to Dalton in his car that looks like he bought off a Somali pirate. Unlike the original, he doesn't drive a shitty car because he's afraid someone's going to wreck his beautiful Mercedes. He drives a shitty car because he has a shitty life. There's also a knife sticking out of him. He got stabbed for being too jacked and making people lose money betting on the fight. He let the knife hang there in his abdomen just in case some chick will notice that he could take a good knifing and offer him a job as a bouncer. But he plays hard to get and declines her job offer. She gives him a piece of paper with her number on it anyways. Reluctant hero stuff. He drives away in his shitty car with his shitty life behind the wheel onto a pair of shitty train tracks where he wants a shitty train to end it all for him. And at the last moment, for no reason at all, he decides his life is not 
not so shitty after all. He takes the shitty job and this shitty excuse for a remake can officially begin. The rest of the film is just as bad. No babes to speak of except for one, the love interest Ellie, played by Daniela Melchior. But they manage to make her look like the Portuguese Kimmy Gibbler. Your other choice is the Reddit incarnate bartender who, when she's not busy collecting cats or eating them, is yelling about keeping hate speech off her campus and bringing Dalton food. The most shocking part of this film is the food actually made it to him. So, uh, babes are out the window. There's no monster trucks, no cool soundtrack, no shirtless Tai Chi, no awesome one-liners, no mullets, no Sam Elliott-style bromance, no roundhouse kicks with cowboy boots, and worst of all, no throat rips. <laughs> What the hell am I even watching? Because this is sure the hell not Roadhouse. I want you to be nice until it's time to not be nice. I think it's time. Beat for beat, the plot to this Roadhouse is the same as its predecessor. Just move everything from Missouri to the Florida Keys. Dalton is no longer James Dalton, cooler and head bouncer with swag and zen, but Elwood Dalton, ex-MMA fighter and depressed psychopath. I call him a psychopath because there is a moment in the film where Dalton hinges from down and out reluctant hero to deranged serial killer. No longer is he the guy who hurts people and then is nice enough to drive them to the hospital, but this killing machine with no remorse. He throat punches a man and collapses his trachea. He clarifies in painstaking detail how exactly he's dying because his throat is crushed into the back of his cranial substructure. The guy does the obvious thing and dies. Dalton loads his dead body into the back of his truck and drives home. It gets worse. Dalton goes to sleep, wakes up, brews a coffee, has a sip, plans out his day, watches the sun rise over the Atlantic, and with a belly full of calf, his day is ready. He walks out the door. Next to the door is his freezer where he kept the dead body. He's no longer Dalton, he's Dahmer. Later, he kidnaps a sheriff, steals his gun, shoots the body, and then bashes the sheriff's brains in before attempting to pin the dead body on the sheriff. Which would have worked maybe if A. Dalton didn't wait for the sheriff to wake up so he could tell him his entire plan and B. Didn't try and bash his brains in. I don't think it takes even a length of a CSI episode filled with halfwits to figure out that maybe the sheriff who was bludgeoned wasn't the one who shot the dead body with a collapsed windpipe. But Dalton justifies all this by saying he has to do all this because he's angry. It's at this moment you wonder if Dalton is actually the villain of the piece and you've been rooting for the wrong team. That is if you made it this far. Dalton lives on a houseboat named The Boat, which should have been named Boathouse, but that amount of creativity would have made this production team's head literally explode. Creativity is the last thing you'd expect when every single fight in this movie looks like a cutscene from last gen's consoles. Jake Gyllenhaal does his best with what he has, which is looking totally shredded while the CGI and jump cuts do the talking during the action sequences. Jessica Williams as Frankie reads all of her lines like she wrote them down on the piece of paper she gave Dalton in the beginning of the movie before he drove off with them. So she just wings everything, she says. Daniela Melchior acts like she has one foot out the door as soon as the hair and wardrobe department Department was done with her. Entering in at the hour mark is Conor McGregor with his cartoonish charisma. He can't act worth a shit and he knows it, so he was on set having fun and it shows. He brings the only nudity in the movie, so that sucks by a lot, but then again, it could have been worse. But the true standout, and I say this with all the sincerity I have left in talking about this janky ass failed attempt at an action movie, is Arturo Castro who plays Mo. He has only about three scenes, but he is actually funny in every single one of them. It's just unfortunate that no one's going to make it to see all three of them. Doug Lyman is an unreliable director who's capable of giving us the Born Identity and Edge of Tomorrow and then turning right around and laying a stink pickle like this Roadhouse remake. Doug might want to rethink his career path and go back to a time when he knew how to make an entertaining movie. As for us, we're going to go back to what really counts. Babes, bullets, and bros. Hey, what the fuck you just do? Well, I control the jump. You wanted him down, he's down.
some steam bennet. If you enjoyed this video, you go ahead and smash that like button. While you're done doing that, hit the subscribe button. And then after that, share this with your friends, family, people you hate. Maybe you don't like my content and just want to waste somebody's time. Do it. Share it. Thank you. It is much appreciated. I'm out of here.